There was an attorney sitting in his office. He had finished his day's work. All the staff had left, and he was sitting quietly behind his computer. When suddenly into the room came the devil himself. The man was not completely surprised, and he s- s- <laughs> and, and the and the and my dad's an attorney, so I can tell lawyer jokes. I have a pass to do that. Anyway, the, the devil appeared before him, and he said to the lawyer, I have a proposition for you. You can win every case you try. You will earn outrageous sums of money. Your partners and your staff and everyone you come in contact with will stand in awe of you for your entire life. The only thing I ask in return is for your soul, your wife's soul, your children's soul, the soul of your grandparents and your in-laws and your children. That's all I ask. And the lawyer thought about it for a moment and he said, okay, what's the catch? (laughs) Well, obviously the uh, the topic of today is temptation. And of course, this is a facetious story. The devil does not usually come and present himself in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork, nor are there uh, demons sitting on one of your shoulders and angels on another having an argument in both your ears about whether you should or should not do something that is right or wrong. But temptation, nonetheless, is very real. But in fact, oftentimes temptation is presented to us not as something unattractive, not as something evil, but as something actually very attractive and very pleasurable. Scripture says that Moses, in fact, was tempted with the pleasures of sin for a season. A friend of mine last week shared an interesting story with me. In fact, it was just Friday at lunch, and we were just walking along the street, and he started talking about this uh, time uh, several years ago, many years ago actually, when he and a friend visited a particular place in a remote part of Oregon. And they drove into this place which normally would be very dusty and dry and desolate, and it was like a paradise. They drove in and there were gardens, lush gardens planted all over the place. And there were these incredible buildings that had been built. The facilities were top notch. They had this huge giant bookstore. The people were very beautiful. He commented specifically on the women and how beautiful they were at this particular place. And he said, the guys were probably beautiful too, but my focus was really on the women. <laughs> and partly the reason was for that was because he knew coming into this place that this community had a very free love sort of philosophy. And so he knew that there was more behind the fact of just the women being beautiful. And everyone was so nice. And they were so welcoming. It was just like a paradise. And he took a walk through the bookstore. And and he was amazed because he saw in there an entire section of books dedicated to Dr. James Dobson. And you you may be aware of him. Focus on the family. He thought, this is awesome. What a place I have found. Then he walked to the next section in the bookstore and discovered that there was an entire section dedicated to Buddha and to Krishna and to a whole bunch of other things, and he began to realize that this paradise that he had found himself in might not be a paradise at all. And he said to me, and he was a Christian at the time, he said, I'm not generally a very spiritually sensitive person, but he said, in that place, all I felt was a pervasive presence of evil. The place that he had found himself in used to be known as Rajneesh Puram. If you are familiar with that, the former home of the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, who in the 1980s formed a quote-unquote religious community in uh, what was the Big Muddy Ranch in central Oregon. This is the same group of people that on the outside appeared very attractive and very welcoming and very open, but on the inside were filled with evil. They plotted to poison a U.S. attorney and commit other acts that were obviously quite evil. 
and they eventually were rooted out of Oregon. And what I really like is that the, uh, the Young Life organization ended up purchasing that ranch, and they've now turned it into a youth center. And I had the opportunity to go out there and visit. And it's an incredible place, once used to draw people away from the one true and living God by this attractive evil, now is used to dedicate the lives of youth to serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I like that kind of irony. But it was indeed, back in those days, a very attractive and tempting place. Because evil does not always appear as evil. And that's where we come to the subject of temptation. Someone once paraphrased a famous prayer that you may be familiar with this way. Lead us not into temptation, for we can find the way ourselves. (laughs) Temptation, you see, seems to find us in all kinds of places and often when we least expect it. Now, temptation is essentially when you want to do something that glorifies self rather than glorifies God. Sin is when you actually do that thing that glorifies self instead of glorifying God. Now, it's not wrong to be tempted, as we'll see today. Jesus was tempted, and in fact, every Christian will be tempted. The question is, what are we going to do when the temptation actually comes? Now, how Jesus experienced and responded to temptation is extremely instructive for us as Christians on how we will see the enemy when he comes to try and pull us into a place where we are are seeking to gratify ourselves rather than seeking to glorify God. Because Satan will come a lot more subtly than he came to that fictitious attorney, but his intent is no less evil. So let's begin as we look through chapter 4 of the Gospel of Luke in verse 1. Jesus has just been baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, and that signified the beginning of his three-and-a-half-year public ministry. And it says in verse 1 that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. A couple of interesting things to point out from this. Jesus, it says, was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan. Now, that seems a little bit odd to me. Doesn't it seem odd to you? God always leads us in in secure and level paths good things and joy and happiness and nothing ever goes wrong. God would never lead us into a, into a place where we're going to be tempted by the devil, would he? And yet, it says that God's spirit led Jesus into a time of extreme personal struggle and temptation. Why? I've often wondered about this. First of all, was there any question that Jesus would fail? Was, was God testing Jesus, the Son, to see, oh, well, now we'll see if what he's really made of. We'll see if he can really be the Son of God. We'll, we'll see if, if the archenemy Satan can come and knock him off his, his place as the Son of God. Was this a test to see if Jesus would fail? No, I don't, I don't think so at all. I don't think that there was any question about the outcome whatsoever. This wasn't to see if Jesus would fail, this was to show that Jesus would triumph no matter what the odds. And partly to give us some hope that if we are full of the Spirit, we can triumph in the odds that come against us as well. So if it wasn't that Jesus would fail, why did God allow Satan to do this in the first place? Was Satan just simply a puppet in some grand theater that God was running Well, in a way he is, but in a way he's not. You see, Lucifer, who is the origin of all evil, decided one day that he was going to be like God, that he was going to sit on God's throne. That was the point where evil was found in him, and that was the origin of sin. God at that time, or uh, Satan at that time, declared his hatred for God and everything that is God's. That hatred continues to this day. And if you belong to God, you are well hated by the enemy. And he will do absolutely anything he can to disrupt God's plan 
in your life and even try to disrupt God's plan for bringing about your salvation through the Messiah. Even if he knows that it's a suicide mission, he will still go about it anyway because his hatred for God and anything that is God's is that great. Now clearly, as we'll see later in the chapter, the demons already knew who Jesus was. They will declare that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah. They know who he is. And yet, they still, Satan still comes up against him anyway. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus, it says, was hungry. A lot of times we have this vision of Jesus as maybe not quite being human. He was God after all. So when he is there in the wilderness for those 40 days, he probably didn't need to eat. He, he just probably decided divinely to turn off the hunger, or somehow there was a divine IV that supplied nutrients to his body or something like that. Well, no. Jesus, it says, after those 40 days, was, in fact, hungry and probably tired, too. Have you ever camped out in the wilderness for a day or two and slept on the ground? How about for 40 days? I think that you'd be pretty sore and pretty tired after that. And it's at that point you can, in fact, fast for 40 days. That is on the edge of possibility. If you go any longer than that, your body will simply die. So it's not humanly impossible for Jesus to have fasted for that long of a period of time, but you know that him, him being fully human, he was quite exhausted, tired, hungry, and weak. And it's at that point where Satan pounces on him. And you know, Lucifer knows the exact right time to pounce on your life as well. Do you ever notice that when you're on a spiritual high, you're at the top of the mountain, God has worked miracles in your life, and you're worshiping him, and you're full of joy and power, and the spirit is just alive inside of you. You don't ever seem to get temptations at that point, no. It's when you're tired, when you're depressed, when everything has gone wrong and your life just stinks. And then all of a sudden, here comes temptation to do something that is outside the character of God, which is essentially what sin is. Anything that is not in harmony with the character of God. When we are weak, that's when the big temptations come along. And it's no accident. Satan's temptations here go along a familiar path. Let's take a look here as we go on, starting in verse 3. The devil said to him, I've often wondered too, have you ever wondered what he looked like? I guarantee you he was not dressed in a red suit with a pitchfork and horns. Did you know that Lucifer was probably one of the most beautiful of the archangels? He was the worship leader in heaven. He was the light bearer. That's what his name means, Lucifer. He was an angel of light. Oftentimes, temptations do not come to us dressed in red with a, with a sneer. They come dressed in light with a smile. But look out. Anyway, so Satan appears to him. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you, I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And that is the highest point of the temple mount. It's the, the highest place, the furthest from the ground. And it, it is a sheer cliff there, way, way, way down to the bottom of the Kidron Valley. He took him to the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, Satan's getting smart, he's trying to use Jesus' own game against him, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. He is accurately quoting scripture here, by the way. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to test. And then at that point, the other gospel, uh, gospels declare to, to him, 
be gone. Satan left him. It says, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Temptation. It's familiar territory for the devil. And these three temptations are actually quite familiar. Satan first brought the same type of temptation to someone else, not out in the wilderness, but in the middle of the Garden of Eden, way back in the book of Genesis. Eve, in Genesis chapter 3, was also put in, in Satan's presence in the form of a serpent, in the guise of a serpent, and And he got Eve to do the one thing God told her not to do, and that was to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he did it by putting in front of Eve a doubt of God's word that God said, if you eat from this tree, you shall surely die. And Satan said to her, you shall not surely die. And she believed Satan's lie over God's truth, and that's why we all fell because both she and her husband ate. And look at what it says here. Listen to what it says in in Genesis chapter 3. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and also gave some to her husband, Adam, who was with her. So they both ate. Because the tree was good for food, a delight to the eyes, and desire to make one wise. Later on, many, many years later, the Apostle John would recharacterize these same three types of temptations this way in 1 John chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. For all that is in the world, the Apostle wrote, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Out of the New King King James Version. So, for Eve, the lust of the eyes was that it, it was a delight to the eye. The lust of the flesh was that it was good for food. And the pride of life was that it was there to make someone wise. So these same types of temptations that happened in the garden that the Apostle John talks about in his first letter are the same types of temptations that Satan brought to Jesus Christ there in the wilderness after those 40 days. The lust of the flesh. Jesus was hungry. If you are the Son of God, command that these stones be made into bread to satisfy the hunger that you were feeling. The lust of the eyes. I will give all of the kingdoms of the world to you because they are mine to give if you will simply bow down and worship me. The pride of life. Setting him on the pinnacle and saying, test and see if God will really take care of you. Throw yourself off and see if his scripture is really true when it says that his angels will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now notice two important things about how Jesus combats the temptations of Satan. Number one, he does it by using God's word. He says to Satan, not, get out of here. I don't like you. Why are you saying this to me? He doesn't even take Satan on in his arguments. He simply says to Lucifer, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. You shall worship the Lord God and you shall not test him. So Jesus combated Satan by God's word. Even the Son of God didn't take authority over Satan by himself. He trusted in the written word of God. Now, it's interesting because Jesus Christ himself is the word, and yet he relied upon what had been written in order to combat the temptations of Satan. You know, These three types of of temptations that we're looking at here, they are the same ones that Satan will bring to us as well. And Jesus combating him with the word of God is is the most important weapon we have. In fact, the Bible uses the image of a sword to characterize the word of God, that it is living and active 
and sharper than any two-edged sword. God said about his word, it will never return to me void. In other words, not doing something, but will accomplish that for which I have sent it. We do not take advantage of the power of God's word when we are faced with the temptations of the enemy. That should be our first weapon that we pull out of our arsenal. Instead of fighting against Satan, we should let God fight for us by using his word. Now, secondly, I want you to notice something else here, that the needs that Satan brought before Jesus were not evil in themselves. It was not bad to eat bread. What is, was it? No, it's not bad to eat bread. Jesus would, in fact, own the entire world. He would obtain all authority. That was his to have. And it was true what Lucifer quoted to him that the angels would indeed protect Jesus until it was time for him to be crucified. What would have been wrong? Not the needs, but the way they were to be fulfilled or the timing in their fulfillment. Creating bread at that time, Jesus could well have said, become bread, and it would have been so, because when Jesus speaks, things happen. But what what it would have done was to have circumvented what God was doing in Jesus at that time. It would have stopped short an important trial and an important witness for what Jesus was facing and what he was to have to do, and that was to show his obedience to God in the face of denying of self. So it wasn't eating that was bad. It was when it was taking place and how it would take place. Having authority was not bad in and of itself, but having it at the price of worshiping Lucifer, that would be wrong. Oftentimes, we in our society, we bow before the altar of self-pleasure, of money, of power, no matter what the circumstances are that we would obtain those things. We worship that instead of worshiping God. So it's not that having authority is bad, but is the authority being used to glorify yourself or is it being used to glorify God? And having God's protection is not a bad thing either, is it? God gives his angels charge concerning us as well. The book of Hebrews says that they are ministering spirits sent to aid the saints. They are here to help us. But to make God prove his love. God, I don't think you really love me after all. I want you to prove it. I want you to, I'm going to go into the other lane because there's a car coming the other way. And if you really love me, you'll make the angels push my car back out of the way so I won't die. Folks, don't try this at home. Don't try it on the road, because what will happen is you'll end up in a head-on. It's not that God doesn't protect you, but for you to demand of God a sign to prove his love for you by doing some supernatural miracle on your behalf, that's not right. So Satan came at Jesus with everything that he had when Jesus was at his weakest. Jesus, using the word of God and the truth of God, saw through the attractiveness of the evil temptations. And in the end, when Satan had enough, it says that he departed. He brought to Jesus every temptation. But he didn't leave forever. It says that he left until an opportune time. Lucifer was not done with Jesus. And, you know, that's a really good, important point for us to realize as well. Because, you know, sometimes we can steal ourselves up. We realize Satan is is coming against me. It's a temptation. I got to really put myself into this and walk with the power of the Holy Spirit and use God's word to defend myself and to drive Satan out. And then Satan goes, you go, oh, man, that's over. Now I can just let my guard down and just let go. Know for certain that Satan is looking for an opportune time in your life as well to come back. And we'll get to more on that here uh, in the conclusion of our study this morning, talking about some tips on how we can uh, handle ourselves in the midst of 
temptation. So Satan was coming back, and he will come back big time in the Garden of Gethsemane and to try and subvert the will of God at the crucifixion. But anyway, let's go on to verse 14, chapter 4. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And it, as it was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And then they said, Is this not Joseph's? Son, so Jesus, baptized by the Spirit, led by the Spirit to tremendous trial and temptation, and then in the authority and the power of the Spirit, begins his public ministry there in his hometown of Nazareth. He really sets the stage for his ministry, and it's amazing to me, I guess it shouldn't be, that he, he came to the synagogue, and he normally he was a, he was a teacher, and so they would have a reading that they would have every week. And that week, it just happened to be out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. And of course, Jesus knew that that was going to be what it was, because it was actually Isaiah 61 in this portion was proclaiming release from captivity in Babylon for the children of Israel. But there is a second fulfillment to that, and that is the release of captivity to the bondage of sin for God's children through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so he proclaims that in the open. And at first it seems as if everyone there in Nazareth is going, wow, what gracious words that he shares. And then they make this little comment. Is this not Joseph's son? Did a light just go out here? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Is this not Joseph's son, they said. Jesus in his own hometown was not accepted as the Messiah. In fact, some extra-biblical evidence suggests that the people in his hometown actually possibly believed a rumor that Jesus Christ was the illegitimate son of Mary and the union between her and a Roman soldier. And so the, he was uh, really chastised, and, and the reaction from his, the people in his own hometown was very negative. And look and see what he says to them in verse 23. Doubtless you will quote this proverb to me, physician, Heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was, was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. And when they had heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Pretty amazing, pretty amazing, incredible story. I think that the people of Nazareth 
were exhibiting a double standard. They were saying, is this not Joseph's son? Isn't this that kid that supposedly his father was Joseph? They downplayed him. But on the other hand, they also wanted to control him. They wanted him to perform for them. If you think you're so hot, do this miracle for us. Does that remind you of anyone that we just met? When Jesus would not do it, and in fact, um, in Matthew's gospel, it tells us that Jesus did not perform any miracles there because of their lack of belief. And that comes out here in the story a little bit later about the difference between those who will receive God's blessing and miracles and those who will not. And it does involve whether you believe in Jesus. But Jesus says to them, you know, think about what God did in the time of Elijah and Elisha, where God's people had rejected the Lord. And so God sent his prophets to the Gentiles, to other people. Sidon was a Gentile area. Naaman was from Syria that was a Gentile country. And the point is that if those people that God has chosen reject him, he will take his word and his miracle healing power to those who will accept him. This is a foreshadowing of the fact that Jesus is going to take the gospel out to the Gentiles as well, and we should all be very glad of that. So this makes those people very angry. You mean because we don't believe you're not going to perform this miracle for us, you little runt? We saw you running around as a kid. We changed your diapers. How dare you come against us? And the fact that he quoted from Isaiah 61 and then said, okay, folks, today this scripture is being fulfilled in your hearing. He was proclaiming himself to be the Messiah. And the Messiah, who grew up in Nazareth, ought to do what we tell him. He ought to obey the elders, even though they didn't really believe him, even though they didn't really trust him. And so they got very angry. And they took him up on the brow of the hill to just throw him off the cliff, to be done with him. This guy's committed blasphemy. He deserves to die. And somehow, Jesus just walks through their midst. Now, was it a miracle? Did suddenly Jesus become unrecognizable to them and he just sort of walked away? I don't know. The scripture doesn't really spell that out to us. It could be just in the midst of all the confusion, Jesus, you know, they were running around looking for people to throw off the cliff and he just kind of, you know, walked away. And you know how people are when they get really upset. They, they tend to get very focused on something and sometimes you can just walk away. I think, too, we sometimes think that Jesus would have stood out in a crowd. I, I don't know, maybe if he glowed in the dark or he was like, you ever see those pictures of Jesus? He's always the most handsome person you could ever imagine. And usually he's, he's like white with long, semi-curly brown hair, you know, and very tall and all that kind of stuff. In fact, most paintings of Jesus I think you find are the best type of person in the age in which the painting was, was, was made. But in fact, Scripture tells us that uh, the Messiah, that Jesus Christ, was actually nothing pretty to look at at all. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with, with grief. He was not the most beautiful person. In fact, he was a very ordinary looking person at all. Some have suggested, in fact, that the most beautiful person among the uh, disciples might have been Judas Iscariot. He's not someone we would have chosen by looking at him to be the Messiah at all. And yet he was. So maybe that was it. Maybe he was just an ordinary looking guy that he, you know, he just looked like every other 30 year old guy in Nazareth. And so he just kind of walked away. I don't know. But for whatever reason, he walked away. Now, it's possible that we're seeing an example here of exactly what Satan was trying to do to Jesus during the temptation. That is, he will give his angels charge concerning you. And that suddenly, maybe Jesus wasn't recognizable. Maybe Jesus was standing in the midst of some really burly-looking guys all of a sudden. And so they just plain old didn't see him. But those burly-looking guys might actually have been angels surrounding Jesus. And he walked out of their midst. Why? It wasn't time. 
Jesus had not done all the things that God wanted him to do. Jesus was going to die all right, but it was going to be his idea, laying down his life, not the idea of anyone else. So then verse 31, and he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Real contrast between what happened in Nazareth and what happened there in Capernaum in Galilee. Um, And it became Jesus' headquarters, in fact, there in Galilee, um, on the north uh, shore of the Sea of Galilee. And, And Capernaum is still there. In those days, it was a thriving city. And it's not so much today. It's pretty much in ruins. But you can go there, and it's kind of cool because you can see some of the different buildings that were there. And and, and we're going to see here in a second that Jesus is going to go to Peter's house. And they found a house that they believe might have been Peter's house there in Capernaum. So that's kind of cool. I've I've been there and and seen that. But it it was a, a town that had influences from the Roman culture as well as influences from the Israeli culture. So it was a really perfect place to Jesus to have his headquarters of his ministry. And, um, This healing of the demon-possessed man was the first miracle that Luke records Jesus doing uh, during his ministry. And there is absolutely no doubt here who is really in control. Now compare that with the first part of the chapter here where Jesus doesn't combat. Lucifer at all. He lets the temptations take place and he just says, it is written, it is written. He just withstands them and Lucifer leaves. Well, here, Lucifer has taken hold of, a, of an individual through one of his angels and the, the, Jesus just says to him, be silent and come out. And when Jesus speaks, the devils have to obey. And so the guy, the demon throws the guy on the ground and then he comes up. He basically tells the demon, shut up, be quiet. What the demon said was true, actually. He was the son of God. And he, and he said, have you, um, have you come to destroy us? You see, that's what the demons really fear the most about Jesus. Because there will come a day when Jesus will come back and he will indeed destroy them. But they are hell-bent, literally, to do anything they can in the meantime to try and disrupt God's plan because of the hatred of their master and of their own, of their own selves against the Lord and anything that belongs to to him. Now, Satan could have said, or I mean, uh, Jesus could have said, be destroyed. And he would have. Poof. He would have been destroyed. But it wasn't, it wasn't time yet. And so Jesus just threw him out. Um, it's interesting because uh, what this demon said about Jesus was actually true. But it wasn't time yet to proclaim those truths not in the way that the demon was trying to do. And I think that it's also important that um, we should never let the enemy proclaim God's truth because he will always do it in a way that will try to circumvent what God is really all about. Okay, verse 38. So he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. This is Peter. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever and they appealed to him on her behalf and he stood over her and rebuked the fever And it left her, and immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Christ. What a difference here in the Galilee region than in Nazareth. Now, one thing that we need to... um, point out here about this story. Jesus did not heal Peter's mother-in-law because he was hungry for supper. (laughs) I'm hungry. Got anybody around here who can fix me some dinner? 
Oh, so you're sick, huh? We'll take care of that. Get out of there, fever. All right, woman, I want some dinner. Just get that out of your mind. That is not what was taking place at all. Simon's mother-in-law, though, is very sick. And Jesus so completely and utterly heals her, and she is so completely and utterly in awe of Jesus as this incredible master that it is out of the gratefulness in her heart that she gets up and serves him. That should be the typical response of someone who is also sick with the fatal disease of sin, whom Jesus heals completely and utterly by the sacrifice of himself on the cross. And we too ought to be so grateful and thankful that we want to rise and do anything we can to serve the master, Jesus Christ. Incredible. Now, I noticed something else here that is pretty common to Jesus' miracles, and I don't know if you notice it here. It, it says that they implore Jesus to heal Simon's mother-in-law, and that all that were sick, they brought them to him. Jesus is not the kind of person that would barge into the house and go, okay, anybody sick in here? Come on over, I'm going to heal you. Jesus doesn't barge into our lives and force himself on us. Jesus is a gentleman. He waits to be implored before he moves. And I like that. It says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. He rewards those who seek him. Jesus isn't just going to barge into your life and throw his weight around. He wants to be sought, and once you seek him, then he will make himself known to you. And that's what happened in the ministry there in the Galilee. And then in verse 42, when it was day, He departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So here's another crowd that comes after Jesus. Contrast what happened in Nazareth. The crowd came at him. They brought him up on the brow of the hill to throw him off and kill him. They were rejecting him utterly. But here this crowd comes after him and says, we can't get enough of you. Please stay. Please heal us. We want to be in your presence. What an incredible contrast between two groups of people. One who downplayed the credentials of the Messiah, Jesus, and said he's just an ordinary boy that we saw grow up. And trying to force Jesus into their mold. Contrast that with the people of Judea, the people of Galilee, who, who recognized Jesus for who he was and laid down at his feet to worship him and to serve him and saw the miracles that he had done in people's lives and said, please don't leave, we want you to stay. And that's a main difference between two groups of people, one who will reject Jesus as the Messiah today, maybe because they think he was just a man. Oh, he was a good man, all right, but he was just a man. He wasn't God. Because if he was God... I would have to actually reckon with that. I would have to deal with it. It would mean something in my life. But if I can just relegate him to the pages of history, well, then I can just ignore him. Those people will not receive the miracle of the forgiveness and the healing from sin. But only those who will come to Jesus and seek him, they will see the Messiah. They see their need for him. And they bow themselves at his feet. So in conclusion here, there are actually a number of things that we can take out of this chapter, and I would encourage you to go to the website, calvarychapelnewburg.org, and check out some of the study notes that will be on there in the next few days, because there are a lot of other things that are in this chapter that we're not going to get to for lack of time. But what I do want to do is to talk for just a couple quick minutes about temptation and how do we combat it. And I want to give you, count my number of points here, six brief points from the story of how Jesus combated temptation and how we can as well. The first thing is this, be filled with the Spirit. It says there in the beginning of chapter 4, 
that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led into the, into the wilderness by the Spirit for 40 days. Be filled with the Spirit. What do I mean by that? I mean have an active, ongoing relationship with God. The more you neglect your relationship with God, the weaker you will become spiritually, and the more likely you will succumb to temptation. Paul the Apostle said in Galatians chapter 5, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Don't ignore your relationship with God. Worship Him. Pray to Him. Seek His activity in your life, and you will find yourself much stronger against temptation. Secondly, know that you will be tempted and recognize when it's happening. As I said, Lucifer does not present himself as an obvious tempter. And in fact, temptations often present themselves as something very good and very attractive. But the Apostle Peter tells us to be sober-minded. Don't be so out of it that you don't recognize that temptation's coming. Be sober-minded and be watchful. Always be looking out. For your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. <clears throat> Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Even temptation is used by God to strengthen us. But he says to be aware. Be aware. Number three, know that temptation usually involves self-gratification or self-glorification. Uh, James says in the first chapter of his book, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Listen to this. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, brings, gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, brings forth death. So temptation usually involves an attraction, some way to walk away from God, to hide what you're doing from God. And here's a good rule of thumb. If you're thinking about doing something, would you be willing to do that same thing were Jesus of Nazareth standing next to you and going along with you and saying and doing that thing that you were about to do? If you think, well, probably not, but he's not here, is he? You might want to check out whether what you're being tempted to do is sin or not. Number four, look for the cheat. Look for the cheat. The devil likes to take ordinary needs that we have and get us to fulfill those needs by a way that does not glorify God or is not in concert with the character of God. We all have needs of security and intimacy and many other needs, the needs are not bad. Again, it's how those needs are, they are fulfilled. That is when we can run into trouble. So look for the cheat, because you'll always try and take something that's an, a legitimate need and get us to fulfill it in a way that's not, in, glo in, glo in a way that doesn't glorify God. And then number five, and obviously here, and we've already talked about this, always point back to God's word when tempted by the devil. You know, the Bible doesn't provide an answer to every problem that you have. It's, it's not... Uh, a manual in that sense. But what it does do is teach us how to think like Jesus so that when we are presented with a situation, we will know how we should think and then know how we should or shouldn't act. And then finally, number six, look for the way of escape. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says this, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful and will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape 
that you might be able to endure it. What is that way of escape for you? It's different for every situation. A lot of times it's, I'm out of here. Sometimes it's, no. I don't know what your way of escape is, but Scripture tells us that there is one. So you need to look for that way of escape in every temptation. Now, am I... Uh, am I suggesting that we should go our way today and then on the way out to the parking lot, the devil's going to meet us and he's going to tempt us to do something and because of this Bible study, we're going to be strong and we're never going to fall for temptation again. Well, probably not. That's probably not going to happen. In fact, we are going to fall. Unlike Jesus, who was perfect, we are not yet. We are in a transformation process. The Lord talks about it in terms of a remodel. We're all going through a remodel, and we all got some bad walls and some, some dry rot and some f- funky roofs and things that need to be fixed up still. We got weak points in this battle that we have between the old person and the new. So we are, in fact, going to fail. And I want you, as we conclude this morning, to ch- turn with me to the letter of, of 1 John. Going back to 1 John, I want you to take this scripture with you. And think about it. 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 1. My little children, I am writing these, these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. So you know, in fact, in the first chapter, you can, you, can, you can read it. John says, if you say you don't sin, you lie, and the truth is not in you. We are going to fall for temptation. But when that happens, you see, what the enemy does is he's got a two-edged sword too. Temptation and condemnation. First, he tempts us to do something that wouldn't be in concert with God's character. And then when we do it, he says, ah, look at you, you don't deserve God's love. You fell for that sin. I want you, when that second part of the sword, that second side of the sword comes whipping out at you and you want to just give up on God because he couldn't love you, a sinner. I want you to think about 1 John chapter 2 where John says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, the one who didn't fail. He is the propitiation for your sins. He stood in your place. He took God's wrath for you so that God will love you with an everlasting love. And no matter what you do, Jesus covered it with the death that he died on the cross. Isn't that wonderful news? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you sent Jesus to be an example for us to show us how we can be strong against temptation. But Lord, we also thank you so much that you sent him to be our propitiation. But Lord, you yourself died in our place, knowing that we are weak, knowing that we will fall, knowing that temptation will overtake us and we will not withstand it sometimes. Thank you for being our advocate. Thank you for standing in our place and then reaching out to pull us to yourself, that we can be with you forever, forgiven and loved. Lord, I do pray that during this next week, you would fill us with your spirit so that we can walk about and when temptation comes, we can look to your word and we can see you combat the enemy for us. Lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.